Well, good afternoon, church. Thank you for joining with us here today as we get to gather once again to open up God's Word. Uh, We are going to be coming to a passage today in Acts chapter 17, which actually is probably one of the most famous portions in all of the Scripture. Uh, If you're not familiar with it, uh, hopefully as I read it, it will recall some of the uh, different ideas to your mind that make it so uh, popular in the Scriptures for whatever reason. I don't know why, but people love this passage. It's in Acts chapter 17, starting at verse 16 and going till the end of the chapter. It's of Paul's time as he goes into the great, magnificent city of Athens. Paul is going to be in Athens for a period of over 19 verses, at least the narrative portion will cover that. And what we see here is a number of tremendous uh, uh, examples of Paul's evangelistic outreach uh, to the people of Athens, the great uh, philosophical men and women who made their home there in that uh, city of Athens, which was really the philosophical capital of the world during Paul's days. But what I want us to see here today as we come to consider this passage initially, in verse 16 to verse 21 is where we'll just go up to, is I don't want us to consider the message that Paul gives to them just yet. What I'd like for us to consider here today, and we'll see it as it comes out in the Word here in just a moment, I want us to see that the, the, the effect that Athens had on Paul. And on top of the effect that Athens had on Paul, I want us to also consider the effect that Paul had on Athens. And the reason for this is because we see this stark contrast given from verse 16 to verse 21. And, and really, as we see this, we can apply it very practically to our day as well, too, by asking the same question. Today we'll ask, well, how did Athens have an effect on Paul, and, and how did Paul have his effect on Athens? Well, in the same way, in the same idea, we can ask that question, what effect does Los Angeles have on us, and what effect do we have on Los Angeles? It's really a great missional-type passage which will lead us to be able to be more faithful witnesses in the city that we find ourselves to be in. And so if you have not done so yet, please turn with me to Acts chapter 17, verses 16 to 21, where we will see this valuable, valuable truth of how we are called to make an impact in our city to the glory of God. It says, Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, What does this babbler wish to say? Others said, He seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean." Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that we have to be able to come before your word and to consider its uh, teaching, Lord, to consider the impact that it would have on our lives. God, we pray that as we submit ourselves to your word now that we would come under the conviction of it through your spirit who will teach us all things, illuminating to us the, the wonderful truths that are on display here in this passage, that, that, that we would be able to be a people here at the First Baptist Church of Hollywood, along with that, a church as well that, that has an impact on the city surrounding us, uh, surrounding us, Lord, to the glory of your name. God, we wish to be a church that is shining as the lighthouse here in this city, that we would be able to see many people come and, and know Christ and him crucified and all also that we will be able to go out into our city and proclaim Christ and Him crucified, knowing that all who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. God, we pray that you will bless us with this sermon today, that we would be able to be more faithful witnesses to the glory of your name. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Now, there are some people who are in the world today who are professed believers in the Lord Jesus Christ that think that you, as you become a believer in the Lord, you must ostracize yourself from the community around you. This idea of someone being coming like a monk, who we learned about in our uh, Bible studies on Wednesday night looking at church history, this idea that you must uh, separate from the community around you, ostracizing yourself from everything and everyone around you, not going into the world at all, just kind of living your own life, kind of sequestering yourself away from the evil of the world surrounding you, thinking that because you're a believer in the Lord that you must totally remove yourself from society. This is a practice that has been taken up by people from all backgrounds, not just those of the Christian 
Christian faith. But within the Christian faith, within the early days of the church, there were professed Christians who were removing themselves from the society altogether, individuals who were going to live in the mountains, to live away from everyone, and this, later, this practice later became known, what we are familiar with today, called being a monk. And a monk is someone in the uh, Greek word, the Greek word monk just means someone who is alone. And so throughout the ages, we have, had, have seen many professed Christians who desire to remove themselves from society altogether, becoming monks, making themselves loners in the world where they are actually supposed to be going into the world and proclaiming the message of the gospel. If we were to jump forward many years around the time of the Anabaptists, which was around the 16th and the 17th century, breaking off from the Anabaptists, there were those who we commonly know as the, both the Amish and the Mennonites and the Hutterites. These were individuals who separated themselves from the society, not as individual people, but rather they were joining together as a group of believers where they were forming these intentional communities, as they called them, where they would be able to live separately from the world. This was a, a practice that's still commonly practiced today. In fact, as I was growing up in Michigan, uh, around Michigan, down in Indiana, actually, which is just the state below us, you drive through Indiana, and you'll go through many of those uh, Amish communities, and you get stuck behind them on the road as they're driving their horse and buggy. They don't really communicate with individuals. They keep themselves separate from the society altogether. They have separated themselves from the world. Now, as you think about this, you would say, well, this should be a good practice for us to participate in our own lives. It is good that we would be living separate from the world, and that is true. However, where these people go wrong is that in separating themselves from the world entirely, they never have an opportunity to witness to the gospel message of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because the reality is, is people are not going to them. They're not going to them and asking them what the gospel is. People don't do that. They're not naturally inclined to go out and seek out a community. They often look at those communities as cults or weirdos who they don't want to become involved with because they think you're going to kidnap them and keep them on their, their farm or wherever you are, and you're never going to be able to escape after that. And so it's important that we would uh, uh, caution ourselves when we think about these individuals who have chosen these aesthetic lifestyles, thinking that this is the Christian way, that this is what we ought to be doing. Now, you say to me, well, I don't live that way. I don't, I don't live like a monk. I don't live like an Amish or a Mennonite. What does this have to do with me? Well, the reality is, is that even though we do not live in the same way that they do, we have not committed ourselves to an aesthetic practice. We have not become monks by the definition of the word. But the reality is, is we often will find ourselves ostracizing ourselves from the community around us, removing ourselves from anything and everything around us. What I mean is this. How often do you go out into the world? How often is it that you are going out into the world to be able to make the name of Christ known? Now, don't mistake me here. I'm not saying that we must become of the world in order to make the world know Christ. But what I'm saying is, how often do you insert yourself into your community in order that you would be able to shine as a light for Christ amidst the darkness that this world is in? How often do you find yourself going to engage and interact with the people of the world, people who are not believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, in order that you will be able to win them for Christ? You see, there's a tendency for us, and this is a natural tendency, it's happened throughout all the ages of, Christian, of the Christian faith, is that in order that we are to be not of the world, we often think that we must stay out of the world altogether. We must not go into the world and to seek out those individuals who are living sinful lifestyles. We must not go into the world and participate in, in uh, the, uh, what the individuals are are doing. Certainly, if it's sinful, we're not going to do that. But, but just being involved with the community around us, we think that, well, because I'm a Christian, I must separate myself from that altogether. But the reality is, is that God is calling us into the world in order that we will be able to save those who are in the world through the proclamation of the gospel. As Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19 to 23, for though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more of them. To the Jews, I became a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Now, some people have misused these verses to think that this is a, a freedom that we are given now to be able to reach the world that we then can participate in their sinful practices. They think, well, Paul is here attributing the fact that he is becoming like the world. He's becoming a Jew. He's becoming a Gentile. He would be, in, in our day, he may become like a Muslim or he might become like a Hindu. They're thinking that this is what Paul is referring to here, and the reality is, is that's not what Paul is saying. 
Paul is not saying that, that he himself is becoming like the world in order that he would be able to win the world as many people practice. Many Christians, missiology, there's throughout missiology today, there are practices which people take up where they say, well, if we're going to reach the world for Christ, we must become as if we are them. We must become like them. We must become the world in order to reach the world for Christ. Now, Paul is not considering this, nor is he seeking to commend anyone to do these things. Rather, what Paul is saying here is this. It is the fact that the gospel, that the goal of any Christian is to win people for Christ. And in Paul's goal to do this, he was saying that he was willing to sacrifice himself for the sake of the gospel. He would never sacrifice the message of the gospel. He would never sacrifice his own uh, uh, Christian, he would never sacrifice uh, uh, his own life in the sense that he would give, him, give, him, give of himself to sin in order that he would be able to win people to Christ. But if there were instances where he was able to insert himself into the community surrounding him and he would not disrupt his relationship with God, he would freely do that in order that he would be able to win people for Christ. He would say that he would become a servant to all of them to win Christ, win them to Christ. He had the salvation of sinners as his one objective, and to do this, he was willing to give up his privileges, his position, his livelihood, even his own rights, even his life, even his freedom, if it meant he was able to win souls to Christ. Now, in becoming a servant to all of them to win them to Christ, what did he need to do? Would he be like the monks, or would he be like those who are the uh, 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 Mennonites or the uh, individuals who are the Amish? Would he do that? Would he go and live a secluded lifestyle? Would he sequester himself from the community in order to win people for Christ? No, it's not, that's not a possibility because what we must do as we seek to win people to Christ is we must go to them and we must share the gospel message to them. Paul was not of the world, but he certainly had to live in the world if he was going to be able to make people know Jesus Christ. And so this is what he does throughout his evangelistic journeys. And we have been uh, considering them all throughout the book of Acts and also Peter's evangelistic journeys as well. They were certainly not of the world, but they had to be in the world in order to reach people with the gospel message of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul does this. He goes to the Jews in the synagogues. He meets the Gentiles in the marketplace. He meets with the pagans in the Agora. He meets with those who are slave traders. He meets with those who are slaves and demon-possessed. He meets with those who are very uh, up there in the society, like the city magistrates. He meets with those who are terribly poor. He meets with individuals who are psychics and jailers and philosophers, and on and on it goes. Paul is seeking to insert himself into, into the society in order that he would be able to win some for Christ. He goes to the religious and the secular, the poor and the rich. He goes to those who are slaves and those who are free, knowing that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ would be saved. And so as we come to Athens here in Acts chapter 17, verse 16, going into the close of the chapter in verse 34, this is what we see Paul doing once again. He is going into the world in order that he would be able to reach the world for the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is this magnificent event that takes place where he finds himself standing before the Areopagus to be able to proclaim Christ to them. And that encompasses from verse 22 all the way to verse 34, which we'll look at in the coming weeks. But for our time today, as I have mentioned, what I want us to consider about the Apostle Paul's initial travels to Athens is this. What effect did Athens have on Paul, and what effect did Paul have upon Athens? Again, we move that into our day, and we ask ourselves, what effect does Los Angeles have on us, and what effect do we have on Los Angeles? Now, in order to understand this, in order to insert, insert ourselves into the context that Paul was inserted in here, we must ask ourselves, what was Athens like? What was it like when Paul went into Athens there around the year 50 AD? What was it like when Paul had, 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 had been removed from Berea, as you have been following with us in Acts chapter 17? Paul was in Thessalonica. He had to flee from there because the Jews were wanting to kill him. He made it into Berea, but the unbelieving Jews followed him there. And so some believers from Berea have removed Paul from Berea. They've taken him over to Athens to keep him safe for a time in order that uh, Silas and Timothy would be able to catch up with him on his missionary journeys. And so Paul is here in Athens, and we must ask ourselves, what was Athens like? Now, if you know anything about history, Athens is a magnificent city. It is a city that is acclaimed. It is a city that has been written about countless 
Countless volumes of books have been written about the greatness that Athens was, especially during the 5th and the 4th century BC. This was when Athens was in its heyday. This is when you have the likes of those of Socrates and Plato and the, uh, the introduction of the uh, great marble stones and the statues that you see in our day today, the pres- preservation of the things such as the Parthenon and uh, the other magnificent wonders of the world that are there in Athens. That was what Athens was like in the 5th and the 4th century. Just a few notes for you if you're interested, and I think it will be helpful for us to take note of this because it it certainly has a correlation to our day as well here in Los Angeles. But for Athens, especially during the 5th and the 4th century BC, it was the first example of a democracy in human history being a city-state led by officials responsible to the citizens. We ourselves are a democracy, and Athens being the first, we certainly have had some influence of Athens in our own life here in Los Angeles. On top of this, it was an age of great literature and drama with many of the classical Greek plays coming from during this time. The orators during the 5th and the 4th century B.C. were fantastic. And people today still recite their words, recite their plays, and act out what they were acting out during those days. It was also an age of art where Praxiteles developed the classical forms of human sculpture which have been imitated throughout the ages. Praxiteles influenced even the great artists such as Michelangelo. Athens had a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous impact from the back in the days of the 5th and the 4th century. And finally, it was also an age of philosophy with the likes of Socrates and Plato both existing during this time. Now, when Paul arrives in Athens, he arrives some 500 years after Athens was in its heyday. Athens was no longer the world power that it once was, given that the Roman Empire had overtaken Greece as being the, uh, the chief uh, power of the day. But Rome, knowing the significance of Athens, allowed Athens to sort of remain a free city where they were able to govern themselves, where they were able to keep many of their artifacts and many of the, the truly wonderful buildings that they had created and they had made there. And so Athens, even though it was not the superpower power that it once was, it was still, as one person has said, a representative of the highest level of culture attained in its day. They say that the remnants of its glory days were still there. And so what would Paul see as he makes it into Athens? Now, if you've ever looked at a history book or if you've ever looked at a modern-day book of what Greece looks like, especially the city of Athens, some of these things are still existing today that Paul himself would have seen. As Paul would make it into Athens, he would be confronted with these sculptures and these ornate buildings which were towering on the mountains of the city. He would see buildings such as the Parthenon and the Acropolis, which really were not mere buildings such as what we see them as today, but rather they were temples erected for the gods to be able to take their residence in. Especially it was the Parthenion, which was the temple that was erected to the town's namesake goddess, Athena. And inside her temple that was erected on her name, they had a large bronze statue erected of the goddess Athena there. On top of this, he would have also seen a number of sculptures throughout the city. And these were not merely sculptures sculptures, but rather these were seen as idols. These were seen as gods taking up their residence in these sculptures that were created. And you might think, well, I've seen a few of those sculptures. How many were there actually there? How many were lined throughout the city? Well, one estimate places that there were were about 30 thousand sculptures throughout the city, riddling the streets with sculptures. Every street corner, there was a sculpture that supposedly had the residence of a god in. The Athenians would say everything was a god in some of their philosophical ideas, and so all of these sculptures were not merely sculptures for people to adore, but they were gods that were taking up residence in these marble statues that were created by these men. And on top of this, there was not merely 30,000 sculptures in the public hands, but also there was probably uh, maybe 15,000 in the private privately owned hand. So Paul's seeing a lot of sculptures, a lot of temples, a lot of magnificent buildings that people come to admire in our day even. Paul was seeing all of these things. On top of this, uh, he would also see the fact that there was a littering of the gods in the marketplace, which is where everyone gathered. There was a uh, writer during the day of Paul named Petronius who remarked that in Athens it was easier to find a god than a man there. And so he would go into this marketplace, and this is where Paul is actually proclaiming the gospel as we get to verse 7. 17 and also verse 18. He's in the Agora, the famous meeting place for those in Athens. And when he would go there, there were these large stone pillars. And on, the, on top of the stone pillars was a bust of the god Hermes, the god Hermes, the, the orator god of the Greeks. And his head was all throughout that, that uh, marketplace. And so Paul's seeing all of these things as he gets there. On top of this, what else does he see? Well, Paul also sees the fact that there were many of those who were of the philosopher sect. 
individuals who were spouting their philosophies throughout the city of Athens, countless men and women who were in the marketplace uh, remarking about all of the philosophies that they had during that day. They would probably say the things that Socrates was saying and, and Plato, and in, and in Paul's day, there were those who were of the Epicurean and the Stoic idea. So Paul is in this place. He is in this place, and, and, and he is just viewing everything that is surrounding him. In verse 16, it says, now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, he's waiting for the Paul or for Silas and also Timothy to come and visit him and to be with him. And so he's just looking around at this place, and he's seeing all of these things. On top of all of these things he sees, he also sees the great universities that are there in Athens, Athens being one of the three prime university cities during its day. Athens, Tarsus, and also Alexandria were the three uh, university cities of the Roman Empire. The Athens was a moving, moving place. I- anyone who would go there would have the propensity to be awed at what they see. And what we must consider here today is what was Paul's reaction to all of these things? What was the effect of Athens upon Paul? Think about the distractions that would have been there going, oh, I need to go and see the Parthenian. I need to go and see the Acropolis. I want to see all of these marble sculptures. Look at the, the craftsmanship. Look at the artwork that is here and all of these things. What was Paul's reaction to these things? Well, it is quite striking, and we read it in verse 16. It says, now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Think about Paul here for a moment. Paul is surveying all of these things, and the only thing that he can think of as he sees these things is this, a bunch of idols worthless, worthless replacements for the one true God. That was the only perception that Paul had as he saw that place. Think about Athens in our day. Think about how people marvel at Athens and now all the greatness that it is. How people spend millions upon millions upon millions of dollars each year in their tourist funds to be able to go into Athens to see the the great beauty that it is, even though it is slowly decaying as the time goes by, being that it's some 2,000 years old, many of the things that are still there. Think about that, how people just marvel at Athens, and all Paul could say about it was this, it is a city full of idols. What spiritual perception must Paul have been able to have to be able to see through the facade, the beautiful facade, Mark, it may it be, it, it certainly was, there's no doubting that, but seeing through that beautiful facade for what it really was, it was a city full of idols. It was a people who did not know the one true God. Now, how did, this, how did this make Paul feel? What emotion did Paul have as he saw these things? Was he just like, well, okay, there's a bunch of idols here. You know, what am I going to do about this? No, it says he was provoked at the fact that these idols were there. And this word provoked means to be angry or infuriated. He was steaming because of all of this idolatry here. And it was not a, a sinful anger, but rather it was a righteous anger, like that described of God's anger when his people Israel constantly gave themselves over to idolatry. In Isaiah chapter 65, verse 1 to 3, God says, I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that was not called by my name. I spread out my hands all the day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices, a people who provoke me to my face continually, sacrificing in gardens and making offerings on bricks." You see, Paul could not believe what he was seeing there. It was just idols, full of idols. There was just a a forest full of idols as Paul was there, and he was provoked in his spirit at the fact of all of this idolatry. Now, why was Paul this way? It robs God of his glory. It robs God of his glory and blatantly dishonors God's will. God says in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8, I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. And so Paul is incensed at the fact that God is not being glorified in this place. Here was a people who were smart, they were wealthy, they were individuals who were not fools by any stretch of the matter, and yet they're worshiping these lifeless statues, things that have no power, they can't talk to you, they can't move, they can't help you, they can't provide anything for you, when they could have been worshiping the one true God, the creator of the universe, who was plain to see before them as they were in that great town of Athens. And so he was incensed at the fact that God's glory was being robbed. They were blatantly dishonoring God's will. Secondly, the reason that Paul was provoked in this situation is because it showed him the spiritual state of these individuals. It showed to him the fact that these people were lost. 
He was angered at the fact that Satan had blinded the hearts of these men and women to the point where they could not see God, but rather all they could see were the creations of their hands. All they could see were these marble statues or these busts of Hermes on these big, uh, big pillars in the marketplace. All they could see were these things. They could not see the one true God because they had blinded by the God of this world. And finally, why was he incensed at the fact that there was idols throughout this place? Well, simply because idols are worthless. They're worthless. Only fools find themselves worshiping idols. And Isaiah chapter 44, verse 9 to 20, remarks upon this wonderful, wonderful truth. It says, All who fashion idols are nothing, and the things that they delight in, in the, the, and the things they delight in do not profit. Their witnesses neither see nor know that they may be put to shame. Who fashions a god or casts an idol that is profitable for nothing? Behold, all his companions shall be put to shame, and the craftsmen are only human. Let them all assemble. Let them stand forth. They shall be terrified. They shall be put to shame together. The ironsmith takes a cutting tool and works it over the coals. He fashions it with hammers and works it with his strong arm. He becomes hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint. The carpenter stretches a line and he marks it out with a pencil. He shapes it with planes and marks it with a compass. He shapes it into the figure of a man with the beauty of a man to dwell in a house. He cuts down cedars or he chooses a cypress tree or an oak and lets it grow among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar and the rain nourishes it. Then it becomes fuel for a man. He takes a part of it and warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. Also, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it an idol and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire. Over the half he eats meat. He roasts it and is satisfied. Also, he warms himself and says, Aha, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god, his idol, and falls down to it and worships it. He prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my god. They know not, nor do they discern, for he has shut their eyes so that they cannot see in their hearts, so that they cannot understand. No one considers, nor is there knowledge or discernment to say, half of it I burned in the fire, I also baked bread on the coals, I roasted meat and have eaten, and shall I make the rest of it an abomination? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? He feeds on ashes, a deluded heart has led him astray, and he cannot deliver himself or say, is there not a lie in my right hand? The prophet Isaiah is speaking through the Lord, and he is saying, look at the foolishness of idolatry. Here you are, you're, you're using this tree, you're eating from this tree, you're, you're warming yourself with this tree, and you're also making an idol out of this tree? How pointless is that? It is only fools who will waste their time with idolatry. And as Paul surveys all of Athens, he sees a bunch of fools in that midst because they have wasted their time upon these countless idols that they have made. Really thinking about it as Luke writes these words here in Acts chapter 17, if Luke maybe was interviewing Paul and saying, well, Paul, what did you think about when you first saw Athens? You know, the thought would be, wow, it was just, just beautiful. Think about all those beautiful buildings that were there. You, you know, you think Paul could go into these things about all of the wonderful carvings that he saw. And Paul, he just says to Luke, it was full of idols. It was a worthless, worthless place. There was a tremendous, tremendous spiritual perception that Paul had here as he surveyed the town of Athens that he found himself to be. And really, what it came down to was Paul was able to be able to look beyond the surface of the great beauty that was before him and see it for what it really was, worthless replacements for the one true God. These were worthless replacements for the one true God. Now we ask ourselves, how does Los Angeles affect us? Here we are living in this magnificent city, magnificent city. Los Angeles is a tremendous, tremendous city. People like Athens will travel all around the world to come and visit Los Angeles. They see the lights of Los Angeles. They see the great celebrities that live here. They see the uh, prestigious universities that are here. They see that there is the homes of many of the rich and famous here. You go up to Hollywood Boulevard, they're taking you on a tour and show you all of the different celebrity houses that are here. You have the streets of Hollywood Boulevard, which are lined with the shrine to the celebrities that have found themselves being entombed there as they are being remembered there for all time. Even after they're dead, people can walk up to their star and, and really really say, well, what a great person this individual was. On top of this, Los Angeles is a place that is filled with brilliant doctors, lawyers, and teachers. It is a place that can suit any, any man or woman's heart's desires. You can have anything you want when you come here to Los Angeles. It is a place full of culture, progress, and knowledge. It is a place that people come all over the world to visit, visit to capture glimpses of its greatness. What effect does Los Angeles have upon us? What effect does this place have upon us and our thoughts of God? 
What do we see when we walk around Los Angeles or drive around Los Angeles? What perception do we have to the things that are surrounding us? You see, much like the Athenians did, Angelinos have replaced God with worthless things, and we see it all around us. They are wasting away their days, living in constant rebellion and rejection towards God, their Maker. And so we must ask ourselves, what are we to do about this? The effect is there. You cannot go for even a a, a few blocks and not see the depravity that is surrounding us. Certainly, there are not uh, handmade idols but there are things that people have made into idols, the idol of self, the idol of lust, the idol of of I'm going to do me and I'm just going to live my life and when I die, that's it, I'm dead and gone. I have lived it up for the time that I had been given. If we just go outside of our door for a moment, we can see the depravity of our city, the effect of Los Angeles upon us if we have spiritual eyes to see will be it is an immediate place of a total that that has totally rejected God. They have totally rejected God here in Los Angeles. Not all of Los Angeles, certainly. We are here today uh, to attest to that, but the majority of Los Angeles today has rejected God. And so you say, well, what am I to do about this? What is it that someone who is, who is seeing the things around them, like Paul was in Athens or like we are as we go throughout Los Angeles, what are we to do about this? Well, quite simply, we are to do the same thing that Paul does here. You see, we look around our city, we see the need for the gospel every single place that we go, and we must do what Paul does here. We must go into the city, we must go into those places where we see the depravity, and we must seek to reason with them about the reasons why they need to know the gospel gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Paul does in verse 17. Paul was provoked in verse 16, and so he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. We take the example of Paul and let the provocation that builds up in our emotions where we say, I can't believe these things are happening here. And we go into our city and we proclaim the gospel message to them. Now, how do we do this? How do we do, how do we proclaim the gospel message to them? Do we just shout at them? Do we just say, you're all a bunch of sinners going to hell? Do we get ready to fight them? What do we do here? Well, we go into the city, as Paul does, and we reason with them about, we we want them to see why they need the gospel message. We have these one-on-one contact relationships with them where we are talking with them, getting to know them and their story and, and who they are and what they believe and why they believe it and why their life is the way it is. And then we show them their need for the gospel just as Paul was doing there. Paul was explaining the gospel to them. He was answering their questions and probably even debating with them a little bit about the false hoods that they believe. These are not the debates where they're shouting matches, such as what we would see in our day, but a good, healthy debate can do wonders to be, able to, uh, uh, to be able to share with someone the message of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. But simply, Paul was engaging with these individuals to share the gospel with him, and this is what we must do also. As the city has an effect on us, now this is not the entire city, you may drive around and see things and they may do nothing towards you. You may not even be concerned about them whatsoever. Or you may be driving through your city and you may see a place and you may say to yourself, man, these people do not know God. And it's especially disheartening when you see the individuals who are religious, who think they know God, but are merely self-deceived, worshiping their own traditions, worshiping man's traditions instead of worshiping what the Scriptures have said concerning the Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ. It's especially disheartening when you see those things. But when you see them, do something about it. Don't just sit back and say, oh, I'm so angry about these things. We must not be all bark and no bite. We must go into the community that we are in, and we must share the gospel message to them. We must proclaim the gospel. And so then we see the effect that Athens had on Paul was twofold, and it should be the same for us as well. First, it should provoke us. It should provoke within us this idea that, man, these people are lost here. But then it should move us. It should move us to be able to say, ah, I know they are lost, but I must proclaim the gospel message to them. I must not allow for them to be dragged into hell by the lies that they are believing. Now, secondly, what we see here happening is the effect that Paul had on Athens. And this is important for us to see as well, because as we go into the city, they're going to get some responses here. We're going to get some responses. You go into Los Angeles, you go to a place where they do not know God, they're worshiping someone else or something else or themselves, and you try to tell them that they need the gospel, that they need the one true God, you better believe they're going to respond to you. Now, it's not always going to be uh, troublesome. They're not always going to want to fight you. They're not always going to want to be rude to you, but you're going to receive a response from them as you proclaim the gospel to them, much like what we see happening here with Paul as he finds himself in the city of Athens. What effect did Paul have upon Athens? 
Athens? Well, we read it in verse 18 to 21. This is the initial effect. Certainly, we'll see more in verse 22 all the way to the close of the chapter. But here in verse 18, it says, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except hearing or telling or hearing something new. And so what was the effect that Paul had on Athens? Well, first we see the people that Luke spotlights here. Two groups of people. These were philosophies that were going on during their day. They were the philosophy of Epicureans and also of the Stoics. Now what did they believe? If Paul was engaging with them, much like we engage with people in our day, the, the main philosophy of our society is, is really this idea of the pluralistic idea that, that everything is, is true. You, you don't need to challenge anything that's true. Just believe what you want to believe. And if it feels good, well, that's good for you, and I'm going to do myself. And this is kind of pluralistic society that we live in today where everything's true except that which alone is true. This is the society we live in. Well, what was Paul engaging with as he was battling or, or proclaiming the gospel as a good soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, the Epicureans were individuals who he would have come across, and the Epicureans were followers of a philosopher by the name of Epicurus. This was a man who lived during the uh, uh, thir- third or, or fourth, in the sec- uh, fourth in the third century B.C., 341 to 270 B.C., and his beliefs are summarized as this. There is nothing to be with. They would also be described as those who are agnostic secularists. These were individuals who were just simply living their lives day to day. They were living for the pursuit of pleasure. There was nothing after this life, so live it up now. There was no such thing as a God, and if God did exist, He was so far removed from the society, no one should even worry about Him. You don't need to fear God. You don't need to fear what's going to happen in the afterlife. You don't need to worry about any of these things. Just live it up. Live to the glory of yourself, and when you die, that will be it. Many people like that in our day today, too. They don't call themselves Epicureans, but they certainly exist today. Live it up now, for we eat, drink, be merry, and then we die. This is the idea. This is the theme throughout our society today. Still also you have those who were the Stoics, and these Stoics were followers of a man by the name of Zeno, who was originally from Tarsus. If you're familiar with the Tarsus, that's where Paul himself was from. So Paul was probably familiar with this philosophy, being trained up in Tarsus in the university system that he went through. And these individuals, though they were following a man by the name of Zeno, they got their name from the Stoa where he would teach at. And the Stoa is just a porch. In the marketplace, there would be these porches, and this is where Zeno would set himself up on. He'd set himself up on the porch. He'd teach, and so his followers became named after the place that he taught. They were Stoics. They were those who met at the Stoa. And these individuals were quite opposite of the Epicureans since they believed quite differently from them. They believed that everything is a God. That pew right there is a God. That clock right there is a God. The paint on the wall is a God. Everything is a God to the Stoics. They believed that anything and everything that existed was divine. You just had to figure out how it was, or you just had to attribute it some, div- some divinity, and there you go. You've got a divine God because you said it was a divine God. They have given it all the power that it had. On top of this, what they would do is, in their system, they would fight for the unani- unity of humanity and for kinship with the divine. Their system aimed at living consistently with nature, and in practice, they laid great emphasis on the primacy of rational faculty and humanity and individual self-sufficiency. And so Paul is confronted by these two groups as he is in the marketplace there. As he's in the marketplace there, he is proclaiming the gospel, and you have certainly many different ideas there. Many people would go into the marketplace, and they would just be preaching. They would be doing whatever they wanted to do. They had a message, and they were proclaiming it. This was the common practice of the Athenians. As it says in verse 21, the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. And so this is what's going on. And Paul's preaching. He's proclaiming the gospel. And he has these Epicureans and also the Stoics saying, what is this guy all about? What is this guy talking about here? And so we see their reaction to him. We see the effect that Paul has on these individuals. There's three different effects that he had on them. And we can expect these as well as we proclaim the gospel. First, some of them mocked Paul. They call him a babbler. Now, we might think of the word babbler as someone who just rambles on and on and on and on and on, and they just talk all the day long. They don't make any sense. They're just going on and on with everything and anything that comes to their mind. That's not the idea that they're thinking of when they call a babbler here. Rather, what they are calling Paul here, as they call him a babbler, is a seed picker. 
They are saying Paul is a seed picker. And what does this mean? Well, it describes a bird who picks up seeds or scavenges. And in this context, it refers to someone who picks up bits of information on any given subject and just spouts them as their own. They take any, any subject, they hear someone say something, and they just regurgitate what that individual has said. They don't know what they're talking about, really. They just kind of repeat a phrase. They repeat something that they have heard. These are people who are really not uh, uh, those who are of the, uh, uh, the collegiate level. These are individuals who, you know, maybe dropped out of, of school in the eighth grade. These are, are dummies. These are imbeciles. They're like, this guy doesn't know what he is talking about here. And so they mock him, and they say, what does this babbler have to say? What is, this, what is this fool saying to us here? What is he talking about here? Jesus and the resurrection? What does that even mean? What is this man talking about here? Now, if anyone was not a babbler, it is the Apostle Paul. Paul was a very, very intelligent, intelligent man. Prior to his being converted on the Damascus Road, he was trained up in the school of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was the chief rabbi of Paul's day, and so Paul was an intelligent man. On top of this, Paul did not just pick up the gospel on his own and just say, well, I'm just going to spout a few different things about this. No, Paul knew what he was talking about when he proclaimed the gospel because he did not receive the gospel from any man. Rather, he received it, and he received it through a revelation by Jesus Christ the one who brought about the work of the gospel, the one who is the message of good news. Paul knew what he was talking about because he was both an intelligent man and he received the message specifically from Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 1, verse 11 to 12, Paul says, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. So Paul here, even though he is mocked, Even though they say, what does this babbler have to say? Paul is not a babbler. Paul is not a fool by any means. Rather, these people are really the ones who were dull and hard of hearing. They thought they knew everything. They said, well, I've never heard this before, so certainly it's not true. If I've never heard this before, well, why would I give even even a thought to it? And so they mock Paul, and they probably want nothing to do with Paul here. They don't want to talk to him anymore. This is the first group of people. They mock you, and you kind of just go along your way, and they kind of just go along their way. But there's a second group that Paul engages with here, and it is those who have misunderstood him. These were individuals who were probably the Stoics, and the reason that I say this is because they thought Paul was proclaiming uh, as a preacher of foreign divinities preaching about Jesus and the resurrection given that there were those who were of the Epicurean sect who did not believe in gods, they probably didn't worry about the fact that Paul was preaching about foreign divinities. The Stoics, however, would preach about divinity all day long, and so they're probably here the ones who are misunderstanding him. This says he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And so people are going to misunderstand us as we proclaim the gospel message to them. What do they misunderstand about Paul is saying here? Well, really, it's quite interesting. It shows how they didn't really understand what Paul was actually saying because because they thought that Paul was preaching about two different gods. They thought one of the gods was Jesus, and the other one was the God resurrection. They attributed the God resurrection that Paul is talking about here to the, uh, the, the, the proper name, which is used for the Greek word, which is anastasis. Anastasis in the Greek is meaning resurrection. So when they heard Paul talking about one Jesus and also anastasis, they thought Paul was talking about two separate gods, and he was preaching about Jesus and the resurrection. Now, you say, well, how is resurrection a god? Well, it's because they attributed everything to deity, and so certainly a, a resurrection could be a god if they wanted it to be that way, since that was how their system was formulated. They would say, well, anything's a God, so maybe he's talking about a guy named Jesus and also a thing that happens to people. Those are the gods that he's talking about. We'll often be misunderstood as well, which means we're going to have to clarify what we are saying to these individuals. Paul has to do this as he goes to verse 22 to also verse 34, and so we must be ready for the fact that people will misunderstand us as we proclaim the gospel message to them. And finally, there were others who were interested to, to learn more, and this is in verse 19 to verse 21. They grab him, and now they're not arresting him here. We're not to think of this that Paul is going to be taken to trial here, at least not yet. What they're doing here is they grab him, and they want to know more, and so they take Paul to what is called the Areopagus. Now, we might ask ourselves, is, are these people under conviction do they take Paul as, as, as they are interested to learn more about what he's saying? As it says here, uh, they took him and said, May we know what this teaching is that you bring to us? We, we wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. In verse 20, why, why are they saying these things? Are they convicted by what Paul's saying? Probably not here. All that they're doing here is seeking to get a hearing for, from Paul so they would be able to understand the message more clearly. And so they bring him to the ruling body of Athens during that time, which is the Areopagus. 
The Areopagus was a council of about 30 men who would meet, and they would discuss all matters of Athens' life. They would discuss the, 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 the laws. They would discuss the, the, the theology of the people there. They would discuss the institutions. They would discuss the universities. They would do all of these things. And so certainly Paul fit that category, and so they bring Paul over to the Areopagus to have a discussion before these men, really to get an understanding about what he is saying. Now, a little bit about the Areopagus here for a moment because there's two separate meanings for this word, and we must understand where Paul actually is here. There is the Areopagus, which is the hill that is in uh, Athens. And so some people take this, that Paul is brought up to this large hill where he would be standing before a few people to share the gospel message to them. And that's not really the idea here. Paul is still in the marketplace where the Areopagus would meet. The Areopagus being a hill, it was also a council of men who actually met on that hill, and so therefore they were named after the hill in which they met on. And so Paul is before these 30 men, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, and he is called to proclaim the gospel message to these individuals. He's in the marketplace with them, and he is talking to those who are the ruling authority on the matters of all crime, city life, education, philosophical lectures, public morality, and also the foreign cults. So Paul, fitting that last criteria, he's brought before them. And then we would go into verse 22 to see what Paul is going to say to them. But you'll have to come back next week to learn about that. What is interesting for us here today, or what is most important for us here to consider, is both the response of the city of Athens to Paul and also the response that we would see in our towns that we would go and proclaim the gospel message to. As we go out and share the gospel today or tomorrow or whenever it is that we're doing these things, we have three types of reactions that we must expect. There will be those that mock us, there will be those that misunderstand us, and there will also be those who seek to gain a better understanding of what we say. Now, this should take the fear out of evangelism. You say, well, why? Why would this take the fear out of evangelism? Well, one of the main causes that people say uh, keeps them from evangelizing is, well, uh, what are the people going to say to me when I say this to them? How are they going to respond when I share the gospel message to them? That's one of the the main reasons why people are afraid to go out, take the step of faith, and evangelize. Well, if you know what they're going to do, Oh, that takes the fear out of it. You say, okay, they're either going to mock me, they're going to misunderstand me, or they're going to ask to hear more. It's really simple. Those are the three common things that happen as we go up to the boulevard every Wednesday and share the gospel there. People are going to mock us, and they do, and they're going to misunderstand us, and they certainly do, but people also are going to be interested. This passage should embolden our witness because we see the fact that as we take up the message of faith, the message of the gospel, we know that God will do His work through our proclamation of the words that He has given to us to say. Think about what happens here as Paul goes into Athens. As we summarize what happens here, Paul is provoked by what he sees. On top of this, he is stirred to action, which in turn gives him a greater opportunity for witness. He's provoked, and he could have just stood there provoked, been angry, you know, just just punching his fist at the wall and saying, I can't believe these things, you know, going through the city and just knocking the, the heads off of all of the idols. He could have done that, certainly could have done that. Would that have got him in anywhere? Well, probably in prison, but that's about it. So what he does is it stirs him to action, and as he is stirred to action, God uses the faith of Paul to be able to give him a wonderful opportunity for witness. You see, Paul in the city of Athens, this magnificent city, is now before the ruling council of Athens. And it's not so much about Paul, but really what it's about is the fact that the gospel is going to be able to be proclaimed in that city, a city that was just all over the place. You had, this was the intellectual capital of the world. This was the place that tourists were coming to see the great marvels that were created some centuries before. And here, this is a city that is concerned with some random person who has showed up spouting something they don't even know, and now they are going to be able to hear the gospel message as Paul is going to proclaim it. Do we think that this can happen in our city as well? Do we think that, that, that here we are, just individuals in this large city, what, four million people here living in Los Angeles, but if we make ourselves known in this city, we don't know what it will lead to, but we do know that it could lead to us being able to share the gospel message with those in our city. You see, God, as He calls us to proclaim the gospel message, does not call us merely to be individuals proclaiming it. He wasn't just saying, well, well, look at how great my servant Paul is here. Luke does not spotlight Paul here to say, look at all of the wonderful things that Paul does here. What Luke does is Luke wishes to show how the spread of the gospel was happening. And it happened as Paul 
took up the faith and went into the city, stirred to action, proclaimed the gospel message, and saw that many people were able to hear the gospel message. You see, when God calls us to proclaim the gospel, He does not call us to be proclaiming it merely as individuals or, or even in order that we as a church will be able to make a name for ourselves here in Los Angeles. I don't care to make an impact on this city for my own namesake. What I care about here in making an, a, a, an effect on, the, in the, on this city here is that the glory of God would be on display in this city, that people would know Christ and Him crucified, that people would be saved from the wrath that is to come. This is what Paul does, and this is what all of us should have as our desire when we seek to make an impact on our city. We must seek to make an impact for Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, Paul writes, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making His appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Paul says, it's not about me. I'm merely an ambassador. What does an ambassador do other than share the message of the one who has sent them? That's all that Paul is seeking to do here. He is seeking to make Christ known to the ends of the earth, even even here in our city, the city of Los Angeles. And so then, as we are here today in Los Angeles, we see as Paul was led, to, led here in Athens, how, how Paul was affected by Athens and how Athens was affected by Paul. And we must ask ourselves, How does Los Angeles affect me, and how do I affect Los Angeles? This city that we live in is full of temptations to idolatry, sexual immorality, uh, uh, pride, envy, greeds, and lusts. We live in a city that is full, full of worldliness. You have the lust of the eyes, the lust of the the, 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 the eyes, the lust of the mouth, and the pride of life, the the, the lust of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's everywhere. The worldliness in Los Angeles is everywhere. Everywhere. And how does it affect us here? What happens to us when we see Los Angeles, when we go throughout our city? What effect does Los Angeles have upon us? I'll give you a few examples. To some, they grow so tired of the ungodliness that they flee. They leave it entirely. They say, I can't be here any longer. I'm going to Texas or I'm going somewhere else where the ungodliness doesn't exist on the grand level that it exists here in Los Angeles. Well, to that I say, well, certainly if that's what you wish to do, you are rightly able to do that, but people still need the gospel here. It's not that the church should just flee Los Angeles because of the ungodliness here. We must proclaim the gospel here. So also there will be those within the church who sadly join in in the ungodliness, thinking that becoming like the world will help them reach the world. They say, well, you can't beat them, join them. Let's just become like the world. Let's change the message of the gospel. Gays don't like hearing that homosexuality is sin. We'll take that out of the Bible. If you think you can be saved by going to Muhammad or Buddha or or anyone else, well, let's just say, well, it's universal. Anyone can be saved by these things. You think we must become like the world to win the people for the gospel. But that, again, also is insufficient. It does not save. It, 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 It damns people to an eternity in hell. But still also, there are many Christians and churches that do absolutely nothing about it. They do not get involved with it, and they do not seek to share the gospel with those who need to hear it. They're like the the church of Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. The question we ask ourselves is, what about us? Are we as a church just going to say, well... The ungodliness here is too much. We're going to sell our property and we'll go build a church over in the valley somewhere because we might have some more people interested in the gospel. Is that what we are to do? Should we just sell our property to a developer and say, well, let them build an apartment complex here, let people come and move in here? No. That would be foolish of us to do because people still need the gospel here. Are we going to be like those who just throw in the towel and say, well, you know, I tried. I did everything I could. I couldn't beat them. I might as well just join them. I might as well just join them because, well, that's the way that the society is going today. Or are we going to be like those who say, well, I I see everything going on here around me and, well, I I don't really know what to do with it, so I'm just going to sit here in church. I'm going to come to church on Sunday. I'm going to come on Wednesday, and that's it. I'm not going to put my witness out there any, in, in any capacity. I'm not going to go evangelize. You see, this is what happens often in churches today. They have those one of three ideas. Well, well, I'm just I'm giving up. We're going to leave. We're going to go somewhere else. Or, or, well, maybe we'll just join them. Or we'll say, well, there's nothing that I can do about it. Who am I? I am just one person. You see, we as the church are not called to any of those things. Rather, what we are called to be doing as the church is to go into our city and proclaim the gospel message to them in order that, in order that we would love our neighbors in such a way that they would be able to know the gospel message. Paul in Philippians 
Philippians chapter 3, verse 9 to 11, really summarizes his whole desire, his whole desire for his life and for anyone else for that matter that they would know Jesus Christ. Paul says he desires to be found in him, not having a righteousness of his own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection of the dead. I think this verse really encompasses our desire. It ought to encompass our desire for proclaiming the gospel message to people. We desire to be seeing people saved. We love those who are lost in the world today. God has called for us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. Rather than just saying, well, damn them to hell, let them get what they deserve, we can actually say, I'm going to love this person enough that I am, going to, uh, I am going to allow for myself, I am going to allow for myself to become a servant to them. They can mock me, they can misunderstand me, they can persecute me, but they might also listen to what I am saying. And so then, what I am going to do is what Paul has done. I will go to them, proclaim the gospel message, knowing that if they call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, they will be saved. Now, I don't know about you, but this portion of Scripture has encouraged me to take greater steps of faith towards reaching the lost in my city. What about you? What about you? What does this passage, how does this passage speak to you today? Think about this. We're very much like Athens. We're a large metropolis. We have many wonderful buildings surrounding us. We have celebrities. We have very smart philosophers here. We have anyone, anything your heart desires is here in Los Angeles, just as it was in Athens. What does this passage move? How does this passage move you today? Does it just say, well, okay, it seems like a good idea. I don't know where to start. Or it seems like a good idea, but who am I? I'm just one person. Well, well, that's a thought that I have had as well too. I myself am just one person, but this is one of the beauties of Christ's church. You see, when Christ calls us to gather as His church, He does not call us as individuals gathering, but rather He calls us as His collective body where we are all Spirit-filled men and women who are equipped by the Spirit of God to be bold witnesses to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's not calling for each of us to go on our own to proclaim Christ here in Los Angeles, but He's calling us to come together to proclaim Christ to the city of Los Angeles. You see, if we wish to reach our local city with the gospel, the best way to do it is not going to be on our own. It's not going to be just one random person going out and sharing the gospel. It is the collective body of Christ coming together to make Christ known to the city surrounding us. You see, if someone were to come here today, or if someone was to ask me, how can I make an impact on my city? How is it that I can can have an impact on my city where Christ would be known? What is the best way for me to get started? What I would say to them unashamedly is I would say you need to be involved with your local church. That is the most effective way that you can have to be able to be proclaiming the gospel message faithfully. You need to be involved with your local church. The Spirit-filled assembly of the body of Christ is going to best equip you to make the gospel known in the city surrounding you. You see, when you become a member of a local church, you're not doing it to say, and this is what some people think, well, I'm just going to come. If the church gives me something, well, I'll make make my place there. I'll I'll get fed. I'll I'll do what I need to do, but I'm not going to return anything else. That's not what I'm saying. Get involved with the local Local church to see your city be able to, uh, to, to be changed for the gospel message. What I am saying is that an individual who is involved with their local church is saying, I want to serve Christ and His church. I want to be involved with the outreach opportunities that we have here as a local fellowship. I want to come under the preaching of God's Word as the pastors are proclaiming it. I want to grow in the knowledge of His Word through the Bible study so that I'm able to proclaim the gospel better. I want to be able to grow in faith with my brothers and sisters. I want to learn to forsake sin. I want to learn what it means to care for one another. I want to learn what it means to encourage one another, and I want to learn what it means to evangelize with my brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you wish to be a faithful witness of the gospel, you cannot go about it alone. And you say, well, Paul's alone here. Well, this is the exception to the rule. Paul, this is the only time that I could find throughout the book of Acts where Paul was on an island by himself. This is the only time when Paul did not have missionary partners with him who were taking the gospel message. He first had Barnabas, then he had Silas and Timothy and Luke. Later on, he'll have a few more that he takes with him. We must never think that our impact is going to be had by our own work by the only thing that we are doing. People are not going to be drawn to us. We're not that special. But what is special is the church, the body of Christ, gathering together individuals from every nation who are called by the name of the Lord to be saved and called to make the gospel known to the ends of the earth. 
You see, well, you can say, well, okay, what do, you, what do you mean by all of this here? You're saying that the best way for me to be effective in proclaiming the gospel message is to become a part of a local church. What if I'm not a part of a local church? Can I not be effective for the gospel? No, not as effective as you would be if you were proclaiming the gospel message through the local church. And this is what I mean by this. You see, when the local church gathers, Hebrews 10, verse 24 and 25 tells us that the local church will spur one another on to love and to good works. Who's going to do that for you if you're not a part of the local church? Take this for example as well. If you were not here today, this truth from Scripture would have hardly entered your mind. You would have never thought, well, what impact is Los Angeles having on my life? And what impact am I having upon Los Angeles? This would not be a thought that you would have if you were not here in church today. When you come to the church, you hear the proclamation of God's Word. You hear God speaking to you through His Word in order that you would be moved to service unto His name, that you would be proclaiming His name to the ends of the earth. Think about this. As you have driven throughout the week or walked throughout the week or taken the bus throughout the week, how often have you thought about what is around you? Have you even looked around you with spiritual eyes or are you just kind of just going blindly throughout this city and saying, well, okay, that looks nice or that looks nice. Do you see beyond these things? Do you see beyond these people who are so entranced by themselves that they do not have a relationship with the one true God? with Jesus Christ. Do you see these people? No, I don't see these people. But when we hear the Word of God, when we look at the Word of God and see the message that is before us, we are encouraged. We are encouraged to go forward with spiritual eyes to make Christ known in our city. And so then what we do with this, well, as we go from this place, think about how, how much more perception you're going to have of the things around you. You're going to walk out of this place and you're going to just look around and say, wow, how did I miss this before? How did I not see these people before? How did I not know that these people were lost before? You see, as we come to the church and we gather in His name, we become more equipped to make the gospel message known in the city surrounding us. And as we gather as the local church and we come in Christ's name to gather, we then can go out into our city and make an impact for Christ. And so that is what we must do. It's very simple. How do we apply this passage today? Well, we do what the Apostle Paul did. We are provoked by the fact that there are individuals who are lost without the gospel, and we act on it by going and sharing the gospel message to them. How we do it may look differently, but we all must be making Christ known unto the ends of the earth. We must be affected by our city, and we must make an impact in our city today, and we will do so as we are moved by the Spirit of God to make Christ known. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you have given to us to be able to gather in your name to make Christ known and to learn about what Paul is doing here in Athens. God, such a wonderful passage that you have before us today. I pray that many would be encouraged by it, that many would be able to to not only have a a greater spiritual perception as they go throughout the city that they live in, but also, Lord, that you would move each one of us to act upon it. Lord, help us to overcome our fears. Help us to overcome our our concerns about, well, what are they going to say when I say these things to them? God, just help us to be able to be bold witnesses for Christ. Help us to be able to make Christ known to our friends and our family members or people who we don't even know. Lord, give us opportunities to serve those in our community in order that we will be able to use that as a bridge to be able to share Christ with them. Lord, make us a church that is a faithful, faithful church where we are shining as the light of Christ here in this city of Hollywood. Pray these things in Christ's name.